My name is Peter Hilton. I'm going to talk about code style, coding style. Um, it matters. I'm going to talk about what matters. I'm not going to introduce myself because that would just waste time. That's why I have a website. If you are curious, you would go to the website and read the about page and we'd be good. But please, if you use Twitter, follow me on Twitter for no other reason than it would make me happy if I get five more followers. Look, there's about 100 of you, so I should get at least five more. That would be great. Um, I'm going to dive straight in with what I'm not going to talk about to get it out of the way. Um, I just have to do it. You see, I'm going to have a few code examples, and there's good style and there's bad style. And although code style is somewhat subjective, what we're going to do today is my choice. Listen to me, do what I say, and everything's going to be fine. It, it, it saves time, right? I mean, obviously later you can you know, think for yourself, but just for now, just believe everything I tell you. To start with, we have these two examples, and there's a problem, sort of. One of these code snippets is indented with tabs. <laughs> and yet, they kind of look the same. So this is the only thing that does not matter about code style. Everything else matters a little bit, to some varying degree, but how you indent your code is the thing that does not matter because it looks the same. The reason it does not matter because it looks the same is that this is about reading code. I'm most concerned with reading other people's code because that's what we all do most of the time. We're trying to figure it out. What was this person thinking? Who were they? Oh, it was me six months ago. You're reading other people's code or code from past you. I mean, the only way the indentation style matters is when you've got somebody on the team who's using Hadouken indentation style. This, um, they're both good. Hadouken indentation style is when you do this. Popular in certain languages when you've got lots of callbacks or if you've just got too much conditional logic. This is not an indentation problem. This is a different kind of problem. You should refactor it. And there are other talks, um, other advice about how to not, not do this. Don't do this. I mean, I guess the only thing that really goes wrong if you indent your code like this from a style point of view is that you're going to need a wider monitor. <laughs> but that's not a problem because, you know, you can get pretty wide monitors these days. So, so we're all good. So indentation is not the thing. It's the only thing that doesn't matter because it doesn't change reading. So just don't ever waste any of your life discussing indentation. But if you can use it as an excuse to get a better monitor, then yeah, I mean, I stand behind you there. So first takeaway, tell your boss that I told you that you need a wider monitor. I don't care how wide it is, there's a wider one. I mean, they, they, you can get them this wide these days. They're so wide, you have to kind of move your head. Um, and they're curved and things like that. They're really cool. So get one of those. No, coding style, there are other things that matter. But first, stories and photos. I like stories. And I particularly like this shop. This is one of the branches somewhere in the world of a Swedish shop called Ordning och Reda. And it means sort of tidy and neat in Swedish. And I used to go into these shops quite a lot. They sell stationery and paper things, and the whole shop is color-coded. This is the black section. And they have a yellow section and a blue section. And I used to go into these shops and eventually realizing that I never used to buy anything there. I wasn't going in there to shop. I was going in there because walking around in this extremely tidy space gave me an extremely warm feeling. And it was nice. I just liked the tidiness. Um, maybe that's just me, but maybe other people kind of have that too, you know, the, the appreciation of the neatness. And this is something you want in code as well. You want to appreciate the neatness. At least I do. And I told you earlier, want what I want, right? But style is kind of subjective. So, you know, when I look at this picture, the first thing I see is, that's a wide enough monitor. <laughs> nice, nice. And the second thing is like, oh, isn't it tidy and nice? So for me, that's the warm feeling and the happy place. I'm not saying that my actual desk at home looks like this. This is obviously not my actual desk. And obviously this is staged. Nobody actually works like this, but that's, that's not my point. This gives me a warm feeling. Now, does it give you a warm feeling too? So this is first part of audience participation. Put your hand up if looking at this gives you a sort of a warm feeling and you think that would be a nice place to be. Okay, so it's, it's not quite everyone. I mean, but it's quite a lot of people. 
But maybe, maybe some people feel differently. Who feels a little bit stressed looking at this? <laughs> right, not as many, but definitely people as well. And this is the thing to realize. So who feels stressed looking at this desk? Right, again, more people. So this is group A. But group B, you probably feel quite comfortable here. This is probably their actual desk, and they like it like this. And so this is the first big challenge in coding style, because the person next to you didn't put their hand up when you did, but you both work on the same team, and you're both using the same code. So which code are you going to have? Are you going to have this code, or are you going to have this code? You know, tidy code, messy code. Or, or should I say, unrealistically Spartan code, and you know, real, living, warm, kind of realistic code. You know, this is not a value judgment. It's just the fact that we are a little bit different as people. And, you know, one of the challenges of coding is that we do it with other people. So how can we be productive when we have both kinds of code and both kinds of people? This is my first big claim. My first big claim is that shared code ownership with consistency is essential to success. And the kind of success I care about, and there are other kinds, um, the kind of success I care about is that you know, we're productive, we feel like we're getting things done, that we actually are getting things done, because um, that usually helps us get paid and it's less awkward in the performance review, that, those kinds of things. But I also want the code to be maintainable, mainly because I know that I might be the person still here in six months maintaining it, and I also want that to be a happy place. You know, our software systems, they last for years, typically. Five to ten years is what we should be trying for. If you're only working on systems that are less than a year old, Either they don't matter too much or they all got thrown away and that's not really very successful. So we should be planning for some kind of maintainability. Otherwise, we're just living in the kind of the messy desk world of coding. And I don't know about you, but I don't want the messy desk world. For me, that would impact developer happiness. So this is, this is a, a developer experience issue. And that matters. I mean, there's nothing less than your personal happiness at stake with the coding style on your team. But this is a challenge because of the different kinds of desks correspond maybe to different approaches to coding style, to code tidiness. And we don't agree. We even, we even waste time bike shedding indentation. So we want an important thing, but it's not easy. If it were easy, it wouldn't be worthwhile to spend 45 minutes now talking about it or listening to it. But it matters, I think. Because I think the productivity, the maintainability, and your happiness matter. So to summarize, three things are the things I want, and you want them too. You want maintainability. You want good DX, because developers are people too. It's not just user experience that matters. Developer experience matters as well. It should be a thing, DX. There should be DX consultants, right? Um, that there are, by the way. They just don't call themselves that yet. It will happen. It will happen. Prediction. Um, but productivity too. So formatting code is a little bit relevant, but it's not the most interesting part. But let's warm up to the, the, the tricky questions. So in the interest of getting it out of the way, this is the only formatting style you will ever need. Um, this, this uh, in case you haven't seen it before, is called Eastern Polish Christmas tree notation. <laughs> And this illustrates that something can be so perfect, so beautiful, and yet still so wrong. Um, that it's not just about aesthetics. It's got to work as well as look nice. So, you know, I think we score a bit on the happiness. I mean, I, I, I do feel kind of happy when I see this, unless I actually have to fix it. Um, but maybe less, less so on the productivity. Because I guess there's some kind of indentation and code structure going on here. I just can't see it. In fact, I would be busy changing the line, length of the lines to make it look more like a Christmas tree, um, which is probably not what I should actually be doing. Code formatting is the fridge door of code style. To explain what I mean by the fridge door, we have to go back to when I was a teenager. I was about 17, working in a restaurant, working in the kitchen, and um, you know, generally cleaning stuff. Um, I guess uh, that's the career of a coder started right there, cleaning stuff. And one of the things I had to clean occasionally was the fridges. Um, and boss comes in one day, points at the fridge and says, Peter, that fridge isn't clean. You didn't clean that fridge. And I felt incredibly seen because he was right. I hadn't cleaned the fridge. I'd probably been lazy. But how did he know? He hadn't even walked over to the fridge, let alone open the door. 
I said, how did you know you didn't even... No. He explained, well, I mean, the, the front, the door, the outside of the door is slightly dirty. And a cleaning a fridge, cleaning the smooth, flat white surface on the outside is the easiest thing to clean. You just get a cloth and you do this and it's clean. The inside of the fridge, you have to take everything out. You have to take all the shelves out. You have to kind of get in the corners. Then you have to get all the soap out, rinse it. That takes a while. So what he'd figured out is that if you didn't clean the outside, which is the easy part, you definitely didn't do the tricky part on the inside. And this is the same with code formatting. If you're not formatting the code properly in a sensible way and getting it right, then you're definitely not addressing the harder stuff because some of it's harder. So formatting is basic. It's a kind of consistency that's table stakes. There's no excuse to not get this right. This is like not using a spell checker when you're writing things that other people should read. It's just, it's a false economy. It's, it's, it's impolite and it's not good for the overall experience. And the thing is that this is not for the compiler, right? Code has a structure, it's there, whatever you're formatting. This is for your colleagues or, or it's for yourself. It's for future you because who cares about all of this code style stuff? It's yourself in the future. You know, and plus maybe other people. So getting the formatting right, it's, it's the easy part. So get that right first. Do that. How do you do it? Turns out you can cheat. So there's something interesting to learn from the Go community. In the Go language community, they use this formatting tool. And Go format has this comments in the introduction. It seems they've made some unusual choices. Basically, they've grappled with the problem here. They've described that consistent code formatting is utopia. And they're building up to some big reveal. The big reveal is that there's a tool called Go Format. You run it, it formats your code, and you have no choice about how it looks. In the Go community, there is only one correct formatting. This is quite harsh, but it turns out to be not such a bad idea. Now, maybe this is just because people at Google are weird. This is a possibility. I haven't been there. I don't know. Um, they did it to Java as well. There's a tool called Google Java Format. Now, again, this note in the docs, it's a bit shorter. It's not messing around as much, but there is no configurability as to the formatter's algorithm. American English is sometimes a bit verbose. So let me translate. This says two things. It says... You cannot configure the formatter, deal with it. There is only one style. This is the new hotness in code formatting. Python has a tool called Black, named after a certain car company whose eponymous founder did actually say something like this in about 1909 or something, that he referred to, that he said in the meeting, indeed, you know, all of the cars have to be black. So, so. That's what they're doing here. Um, you can automate formatting, but not just automate formatting in the way that you've always been able to do it, and the tools like Eclipse and IntelliJ and whatever. You can automate formatting using one of these so-called opinionated tools where you don't configure it. You don't even have to spend time doing that. You don't have to have a meeting about discussing how to configure it, because you can't. You just run it, and there is only one format, and everybody will hate it but it's somebody else's format that you're hating, so that's a bonding experience for the team, which is kind of nice. And, but the, the interesting part of this experience when you do this is that day one, everybody hates it. Everybody hates a different thing. Everybody's just got something they can't stand. Two days later, if you've managed to stick it out this long, nobody really cares anymore because it turns out it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, a big moment in my coding career was changing job, turning up, writing my first Java code on the new job and the new company, and um, it's like I was taken aside. I mean, I can't remember exactly how this happened, but in my memory, it was like, Peter, we've got to talk about your curly brackets because you're putting them at the start of the next line, and we don't do that here. So, okay, I want to fit in. You know, I don't want to be fired on my first day. So I started pulling the opening curly bracket at the, at the end of the previous line, you know, the other way to do it. It turns out that after a few hours of this, I just didn't care anymore. You know, it turns out both is good you will discover that you don't really care about coding style. You're only pretending to care because it's an easy thing to argue about. So save yourself years of your life, install the appropriate you know, zero configuration tool for the programming language you're using. And I'm sure Google Format's weird, but whatever. You know, none of us should actually have to care. Life's too short to be formatting stuff by hand, so just don't do that. 
pick one style and be strict about style. Because if you're strict about style, then you can get on to a formatting style. I mean, if you're strict about formatting style, you can move on to more interesting topics. I did this, one of the, one of the times I did this, um, I was on a very small project, there were two of us. We're sitting opposite each other on, on desks. Small project, two, two coders. And at one point I realized, oh, I can configure this formatter and I can configure it to run automatically on compile. You know, and we're using a setup where every time you save it, compiles the code. This isn't Scala, but same difference. I thought, oh, should I discuss this with the guy? It's like, no, I'm not even going to discuss it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to commit it, commit the configuration. The next time he kind of pulls from master, and then compiles, his, it's just going to reformat. You know, I thought sometime in the next five minutes, I, I guess. I, you know, that's I'm sitting there and I'm watching out the corner of my eye, and I saw the moment it happened. I saw the look on his face, and. I mean, I'm not an actor, but it, there was surprise. There was a moment of confusion. We went through the stages of denial and acceptance quite quickly. And it took only about five minutes for, for my colleague to pretty much shrug and then just carry on coding. This is the, you know, this is, this is the, the positive experience. A few seconds of confusion followed by you know, the rest of your career of the, you know, don't have to worry about this problem. Um, and if you have an opinionated former, you don't even have to opinionated formatter, you don't even have to discuss or worry about the coding style. Now we can get on to some more interesting practical matters. Um, so in a way, I've sort of wasted the first 15 minutes, you know, talking about stuff you don't have to care about. But on the other hand, if I were to stop now, I've probably saved you hours of your life. So maybe that was the most important stuff. Don't waste time on inconsequentials. And if you were to just guess what is the rest of the presentation from this slide and from this intro, you'd probably figure out the same stuff I've figured out, and it would all be good. It's not rocket science, but it's not always easy. And the journey is important too. So if you just struggle with the question, what is good coding style, you know, then that would be kind of worth it too. I'm just here to save you time. Like I said, I'm just here to tell you this is the way you should do it. Follow my style. I'm going to give you some rules. So one of the things that we often turn out to be looking for is one of the things I unexpectedly discovered when I worked on this web framework book. Six years ago, we did this um, with colleagues in Rotterdam, Eric and Francisco. And you know, we had lots of code samples in a book, because it's a book about you know, writing web applications. And this is in Scala. And one of the things that became very clear as we were working on the book is that a lot of the readers didn't particularly need a book to learn about a web framework, because it had documentation that was pretty good. But they wanted to understand what is idiomatic style in this new programming language. And I, too, was at that moment you know, transitioning from Java to Scala and trying to figure out what is the kind of idiomatic style in this other language. Um, and so during the course of the two years we spent writing the book, Waterfall Project, anyway, um, my coding style evolved a lot. This notion of what is the idiomatic style was intuitively there for everybody who is who is approaching this. It's clear that Scala code looks a bit funny from a Java perspective. It it became clear right from the very beginning that if you just write code in Scala, you can just write Java code in Scala. And that's it's pretty much just Java. But you sort of feel that you're missing something, and you look at other people's code, and it's not quite the same. So. There was very explicit demand from early reviewers and readers, teach us idiomatic style, which I felt very stressed about because I had no idea what idiomatic style was. I was learning it too. But fortunately, I had colleagues who were earlier adopters. And that was part of what we did. And I was just there to make sure that you know, the, the Java developer who's transitioning persona would understand what's going on. This is a problem, a challenge in Scala, because there's more than one way to write Scala code. So I don't know if you know about this, but it's kind of a, a, a mixed community. It's got academics commercial programmers, mathematicians, whatever. So half of them would, you know, they just write in a kind of, in a OO style, um, which I guess n now they'd be rather writing Kotlin and Java, but same difference. But some of them would much rather be writing incomprehensible Haskell. I suppose there's also comprehensible Haskell, but you know, they, they want to do type level programming and they've got a different goal, which is fine. Um, but the style is very strange to the other group. Two different styles. So, 
this is easy to introduce because this is another community and this is something they grapple with. But it turns out that this is also a Java thing. Almost the same slide. After years and years and years of writing Java code, it occurred to me that we weren't really ever do actually doing object-oriented programming. I realized this when we started doing functional programming in Java, and it didn't really change too much. I mean, we had classes with procedural code in, more or less, and it was really functions, you know. It wasn't very object-oriented at all. Um, so that's, that's, I mean, that's an interesting topic by itself, but the main takeaway here is that there's often different coding styles within a larger community. And this is what you might discover if you move to a different team or a different company, <coughs> that suddenly everybody's doing something a bit differently and their code looks weird and you've got a style issue. If you've ever had a conversation with me before, it probably isn't a surprise that I'm gonna mention naming at some point because it's my favorite topic in programming. And it's famously hard, I guess. There's a joke about that. See me afterwards if you don't know it. Um, but this is a style question too, because naming style is a little bit language specific. There are, you know, there are conventional approaches um, that work in one language that are less common in the other. Length, for example, how long are your names? And it's a very personal style because it's a key creative step. Naming is design. Naming is design at a small scale within the line of code. And it's important. Good naming is the key to maintainability. Um, code style is also about maintainability. So these are, these are related topics. So naming is a good example of how you need to address code style. You need to be explicit about what you want. You need to think about it and talk about it. You need to be able to talk about it. You need to be able, well, you need to be doing code review, obviously, I hope. So I'm not gonna ask you to put your hands up because you should be slightly uncomfortable if you're not doing code review or pair programming or mobbing. It's all the same thing in that context. But um, the discussion you have in review is a key moment to apply consistent style, which I told you earlier on, you must have. You need consistent style in shared code. Otherwise, it won't mean maintainable. If you don't care about maintainability, then you're in the wrong talk, I guess. Naming is also interesting because you really, really cannot automate it. As programmers, we want to automate our way out of pretty much every problem we come across to the extent to which you know, we've all discovered that you know, days of programming can save you minutes of conversation or hours of meetings. Um, and that's sometimes a good call, but it's not always the right approach. And then we get naming. I guess when naming is solved by computers, then we really do have AI, but until then, you know, our, our job is, is to name things well. So you can't automate it. So as an example of specifics, what I'm talking about is you've got to have your own decisions about how you approach naming. These are my current favorite guidelines for how to name things. And I mean, they're mine, and I accept a little bit that they are subjective, and that I like full words with no abbreviations. The only abbreviation, because I'm that reasonable, is ID but no other abbreviations, just dictionary words. But although it's subjective, and you could like short names, you could like the ones on the left, that would be wrong, and my guidelines are just objectively true and right. So follow these. But at the very least, you know, decide for yourselves on what are your guidelines and use your guidelines. Because this is idiomatic Go code. And apart from the weirdness of where the first curly bracket is, because it's been a while since I wrote that way. The thing that really kind of hurts me about this code is that it's all abbreviated. And yeah, I guess, you know, if you're familiar with the code, then it's pretty easy to work out what buff is and what n is, although I don't know how to pronounce it, is nr or n. But I don't want to have to figure anything out. I want to just read it. If I was reading a novel and it did this, I would be extremely annoyed you know, correct writing style in novels is that nothing is abbreviated. Um, I've lived in this country for a long time, and when I was first trying, struggling with re learning to read Dutch, the thing that would wind me up most is in emails and informal writing, abbreviations everywhere. You know, writing out, you know, what, what, is, what does MBT mean? What does CQ mean? What does all of these, what does OID mean? I mean, that, there's, there's all sorts of abbreviations that I guess are kind of obvious if you already know what it is, but it's not inclusive. Um, and nor is this. This is deliberately exclusive, perhaps. 
So there's a whole cultural phenomenon going on here, and maybe getting, you know, maybe this is a bait and switch for C programmers to bring them into a different kind of coding community. Who knows? But it's clearly cultural and deliberate. Um, and you can you can choose, you know. So in in Java, um, the bottom code is obviously God code because it's written by John Skeet on Stack Overflow. Um, but you could do this in a slightly different way. You can make it more concise. You can you can sort of make it. You can do it Go style. You know, the top, more concise example is more or less Go-style code in Java. I mean, it's just so annoying that, you know, the string buffer has this kind of append method. I guess in Go it would be APD or something, I guess. And that would just, that would save seconds of typing. Um, but, you know, everybody who joins the team or learns the language for the first time will waste an hour once. And they, it all adds up. You know, it's, it's small stuff. So... My choice, more explicit. Key thing is to choose consistently across the team. So have an opinion, preferably mine, but have an opinion. Um, that one was easier. You want to take a picture, you can use the left hands. Although the slides are going to be online, I guess. I'll upload them, maybe even today. Um, things change over time. You know, there was a time when you didn't have this choice in Java. Um, you know, for loops were idiomatic, but now for loops stop being idiomatic. Um, and we have this choice of, you know, functional collections API. There's a question to ask you here as Java coders. The question is not, what do you like? What do you do? What do you prefer writing? Because as I said at the start, for me, this is about reading. If somebody else has written this code, what do you prefer reading? That's the question that matters when you're working on a team, because most of the code is written by other people in your team and in life. Like, that's just a universal truth. Almost all of it is written by other people. Who prefers to read code written by other people in the imperative style at the top? Okay, quite a few. It has clear advantages, right? It's not a judgment. I would have stuck my hand up then, and then I had a few years of Scala, and then I got used to the other kind. So who would prefer to read the functional style at the bottom? You get used to it, you know, and, and this probably would have been different if I'd asked a few years ago um, or as soon as this was possible, right? So we get used to these things, even though it looks weird at first. Then, you know, if you haven't written the top style for a while and you're looking at it now, you're probably thinking, and you want to, you know, you just throw up in your mouth a little bit, maybe. <laughs> uh, maybe, you know, or, or, or maybe I'm just exaggerating. Well, let's see. Um, this is a big topic for coding style. Because we have a choice between coding paradigms. Um, if, you've, if you've coded all your career in one language, you might, have, might not have been forced to think about this yet. But that, that doesn't last for very long. And we're increasingly in a polyglot world. And so it's now extremely unlikely that you will, in the next 12 months, only read code in one language. Again, reading, not writing. There will be, even if you're not the person writing the JavaScript or the Python, you know, you might still be reading some of their code occasionally. And there are different styles, is it, you know, the, these, these five styles. The, the fact that these styles come and go over the decades is as much proof as you need that we're in a fashion-driven industry. Functional programming is much more fashionable than it used to be. I mean, it's always been around. There are practical matters that have made it more practical, a more realistic choice. Um, but, you know, don't deny the fashion. The key thing about coding style, the comment at the bottom, is that modern languages often let you do it both ways, either because of backwards compatibility, Java evolved to give you the new choices, kept the old choices, or deliberate language design, like Scala, that deliberately lets you do some weird hybrid of functional programming or, and OO, or, or just one or the other if you prefer. So this is a kind of powerful language feature, but it is a mixed blessing because you have to choose. You have to choose. I mean, please choose my choices, but you know, choose something. Don't not choose because that, that way leads to messy, unmaintainable code. The problem with picking one style is that you can't just do it today and be done because the world will change around you. You can only pick a style and stick to it if you never learn anything. But who knows what you're going to read in the next 12 months? Who knows what you're going to learn about functional programming features that are still not in Java but are coming? Um, you might 
you know, you might, well, if you're going to switch to Kotlin, you'd probably be in the other talk. I don't know, tough call. Or maybe you're just going to watch the video later. You probably should. Um, but also, the more you work with different people, you realize that there's a lot of value in somebody working with somebody who's spent the last five years using a different technology because you will learn interesting things. But that will influence you. And now you can no longer stick to the thing you thought you were going to stick to. So you are going to have to keep evolving your style. Evolving your style is problematic. Right, so um, just to keep things interesting, um, here's some more Scala code. Um, who's, who's regularly reads Scala code, by the way? OK, so minority. So this isn't about the syntax, don't worry. The, the, the key thing to notice is that this is a class. Um, it's a kitten class, right? And it's got a cuteness method. Now, on the face of it, you barely need to be able to read the language to see what's going on here. You know, there's a kitten, it's cute, but whether or not it's cute is random. What you should be asked, what you're probably going to ask here is why. And there are all sorts of why questions. Why is it random? Is it really random? What's going on there? Um, also, why, why kittens? Now, you might think this is fairly, completely reasonable in the context of it being a code example in a presentation because you have to have simple examples because they don't fit on the slide otherwise. And also, kittens are, I guess, kind of shared you know, communal domain knowledge about the world. But what if you were working on a system at a bank, a trading system at an investment bank, and you came across the kitten class? You would have a different set of questions, mostly with, why is this here? The only way to resolve that question is not to change the code itself, because the code cannot explain. But you could solve that by having comments in the code. So this is another big style question, is how do you use code comments? This is a great topic because although it's potentially as controversial as the whole kind of indentation character thing, it actually matters a little bit more. In this example, you need the comment because otherwise you're never going to figure out why we have kittens and why the cuteness matters. But this maybe starts to make a bit of sense. The code style question that I want you to care about is to think how many comments do you need? Because zero comments is kind of a comfortable place from a maintenance point of view because then you don't have to maintain them. Right, you have less code. The comments are code. They are part of the code. If there's more code, it's more maintenance effort. Right? So you can just delete the comments, and it still compiles less maintenance effort. I mean, that seems like it makes sense at the time, until you realize that when you're looking at other people's code, you'd probably rather have the comments, because otherwise, who even knows what this code? Well, you might know what it does, but you won't know why. Is this enough? Do you need more comments? I mean, do you need the, the note that says that it's not actually supposed to be random, we just didn't build that yet? We thought we'd fake it in the first sprint and see if anybody notices, but realistically, we're going to have to kind of finish that. Um, do you want to know things like preconditions and postconditions, things that could realistically be expressed in unit tests, but only if you actually wrote those tests and you quickly find them from this code? Because um, otherwise, you know, what's the spec here? And it's not a terrible plan to put things in comments that you couldn't otherwise guess. Um, there are better ways of doing all of these things. Personally, I would want to refactor the code so it doesn't return an int integer type. You know, it should be a, a kit and cuteness type that just doesn't allow invalid values. But again, different topic. So sure, you can refactor the code, but only if you actually already have. I think you need the comments um, if you, you know, haven't actually made the code perfect yet. Again, a style question. If you are able to make all of the code perfect, you probably don't need very many comments. Um, however, here's the point where look to your right. The person next to you, imagine them working on your team. Maybe you don't even know that person. How confident are you that their code is perfect and doesn't need any comments? In a maintenance project where I've got code written five years ago by somebody who doesn't even work here anymore, I'll take the comments. Thank you very much. Um, I've been there. I, um, you know, I, I, and, and obviously, I want the comments to be maintained and correct. There are other kinds of issues we have to deal with. So in Java, things might be null. And this is a constant source of pain in the life of a Java developer. Now, there are multiple ways to deal with this. Um, it would be nicer if things never were null. But you know, to start with, at least, we need to maybe check. There's more than one way to check. We have new tools because we have an optional type, and we can tidy it up a bit. But ultimately, there's still choice in the language because of backward compatibility and the billion-dollar mistake of just having null references in the first place. 
there's more than one way to code this. You need to choose. You need to choose one consistent approach on your team. Because if you fail to make this choice, if half of your team um, code such that a method will never to return null, because that would obviously be weird, and it's either going to return an object that's not null, that maybe represents something empty, like the collections API, collections empty, or it's going to throw exceptions, because you think things should never be null. If half the team's doing that, and the other half the team thinks if you call a finder method and there's nothing in the database, it just returns null instead of a list that's empty, you have bugs. You have code that maybe compiles, and then runtime, no pointer exception. Story of our lives, right? So code style is part of the fix. Refactoring is the solution. You obviously need to refactor and, and fix these things. The question is, what is your target style? What do you refactor to? Do you refactor to null checks everywhere? Every time you call something, you have an unknown, unsafe value, you do the first option, if statement. Do you do assertions and assume that if all of the assertions pass when you run your unit test, it's going to be fine in production? What could possibly go wrong? Um, do you wrap everything in optional? Or at this point, have you already given up and moved to Kotlin? Because it turns out that Kotlin sort of, in theory, doesn't solve this problem, but in practice it does. In theory, it doesn't solve the problem, because in theory, you can have all of the same problems that you do in Java with things that are null. But what's one of the things that's different about modern, or let's say newer programming languages, different, to, different from a code style perspective, is that they have less code style cultural cruft. Java has evolved its coding style over so many years and brought in so many communities that there are so many different ways to write Java code. Newer languages, partly because they're new and partly because they deliberately address this in documentation and their community, have a tighter idiomatic style. So if you're going to write idiomatic Kotlin, it's pretty much just not going to have nulls. You could, but it wouldn't be idiomatic. And a lot, of, you know, a lot of newer languages have that stronger, more consistent sense. Maybe that's the most interesting thing about Go, not the other weird things about the language, but that it's explicitly designed to have a consistent across lots of people coding style. That's the solution. Um, OK, so let's go back to the kitten. Um, Java this time. What's wrong with this? It's a question of style. If you've, if you've been writing code in this style, this seems all completely normal. If, on the other hand, you realize that you don't like, if you like strongly typed code, you probably don't like stringly typed code, and everything's a string here. And so an alternative coding style is to have types for everything and to not use string and date and, and numbers. This is a bit broader than simple, you know, this is where it's getting more interesting than just what does the code look like. This is actually a change to the code itself. This is a refactoring. This is the refactoring that addresses an anti-pattern called primitive obsession, where you use Java primitive types, let's say, and include string and date in primitive in that sense, instead of domain types. Now, this has changed over the years. Dom Domain-driven design is a thing. A defining part of that topic is um, in a Victor's language and a type system and a bounded context. And strongly typed programming is popular but not universal. So you have to choose. This is a more interesting conversation to have with your team. Do we want to refactor so that we don't have um, you know, the primitive types? You can do coding cutters about um, these kinds of refactorings. You can try it out. You don't have to commit to your whole code base. You can do an exercise to try, what if we, you know, what if, if, what if we do the Roman numerals thing and we're going to refactor it to not use any primitive types? What is it like? Do we like it? Who's done that? Who's done a, um, a coding cutter, a coding sort of exercise, implemented Roman numerals in Java? Nobody. Wow, maybe one. So I can't explain it, but just by the way, this is... If, if you ask this in London or Berlin, half the hands go up. For some reason, software, crafts and, software crafter community and coding cutters and stuff is just not a thing in this country. No idea why. It just isn't. doesn't mean you can't refactor your code like this. Um, and there are websites for it. It's a great idea. Something you should look up. Primitive obsession. Here's another one. Who thinks this looks weird? Who regularly uses... Okay, hands up. If you regularly use package visibility in Java, 
It's not public and it's not private. So it's, it's always been a built-in language feature, but that was, what, 5%? Why is that? What would it mean? What would you do differently? What would this bring you? This is an interesting conversation to have with the team. This is a style that you've maybe never tried. Why not? It's the default. Why do we not use the default as Java programmers? I kind of know why. It's historical. We can blame the lasagna architecture that Sun promoted in, Java, in J2EE years ago. Everything should be separated in layers, you know, um, front-end, domain logic, you know, data access and stuff. Um, that puts everything in different packages, and so you can't use this. If you, were to try, if you were to use this and make it useful, you'd have to structure your code differently. This is a good conversation to have. So although it, this is a coding style question, the implications are broader. It's, it's application architecture style. I guess that's a feature, not a bug <coughs> of the coding style session. What about final? Who declares everything final? More, still the minority, maybe 10, 15%. Um, so here I'm talking about kind of fields and you know, local variables that aren't going to be modified. So I wasn't really thinking about methods and classes. But what about you know, method parameters? Like if you put your hand up earlier, do you also have the method parameters final as well? How far do you go? You know, okay, that was two hands, right? Three, maybe. Um, as a coding style, this is extremely weird if you don't do it. Again, a few years after the, the, one of the other stories, I changed company again, I changed team, I joined the team. My first thought is, oh my god, everything is a string in this Java code base. Um, you know, let's, let's, let's start introducing some different things. I started kind of committing you know, code with the final keyword. Yeah, that didn't go down well. The, the, uh, the, the CTO, who said to me, is writing code, who'd written most of the code, it's just clutter, get rid of it. It's clutter if you're not used to it, you know, and if, if, you, if you do something all the time, you sort of stop seeing it. It's a question of style. I don't, I'm, I'm not as strongly opinionated about this one, but you, know, you should just use final for everything because it will make your code safer. And if you don't like how verbose that is, then use a, shorter, uh, a more concise language. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK, so I mentioned the coding cutter thing. Here's a couple of links. Um, coding cutter is a good way of trying out these other styles. It's a good way of making explicit what the styles are. The catalog.rocks website is great because it has not only examples of the exercises that you can try out. This is a great thing to do on a group on a Friday that instead of working on the user stories that you should be implementing. Um, also, this website describes the constraints. It describes, write it in functional style, write it in no primitive style, write it in pure object-oriented style. That's a fun one. Implement something where you're never allowed to return anything from a method. All methods must be void. It takes you a little while to work out how you can do anything at all. But it's kind of object-oriented programming in a way that we don't do it. It's, it's fun. I recommend this. And the Coduance task list is specifically a, um, a larger refactoring exercise where the goal is to refactor to remove the primitive types. You've got a simple application in Java, and you need to remove primitive types, strings and dates and whatever, from the method signatures. You're allowed to use strings in the methods, but not from the signatures. The first time I did this, it was a bit of a revelation. You know, I walked home from the meetup, and it's like, well, have I just been coding wrong for the last 10 years? Maybe. Awkward. Awkward, but true. OK, so there's lots of issues here that I've mentioned, and these are all more interesting than formatting. Some of them lead to kind of broader discussions. Some of them are very difficult to get good at. And I encourage you to get good at difficult things. That's why I like the naming topic, especially because it's hardest and gives you the biggest payback if you get it right. <coughs> Some of these are language specific, but essentially there's a list of issues that you should have not only an opinion on, preferably mine, but also you should have a, a shared understanding um, on the team that consistency matters more than it being your own opinion that you're following. And that having an explicit choice is good for the team and it's good for your code and it's good for your happiness because it makes the code easier to read and maintain, even if it's not how you would code at home on the weekend if you were to spend time on that. Um, there are other things that I haven't gone into, partly because of time and partly because I just don't even know what I would put on the slide. I think all of the years I've spent writing Java code, I've never had the impression that I knew how to do error handling properly. I mean, who even put your hand up if you are confident 
that you know the correct way in Java for everybody else to use um, exceptions, checked or unchecked. I've, I've just constantly thought, well, I mean, you know, I've got exceptions here and I, 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 I just log stuff. You know, I don't even know if I'm doing it right. There are more topics. You know, hunt out the interesting topics. So to wrap up, I'm going to go a bit quicker because this is a bit more obvious and a bit... It's not less important, but it's a bit more obvious. So highlights. When you're coding on a team, you need a shared coding style. Now, the old-fashioned way, like if you're as old as me or older, you had binders like this in the room where you wrote the code, and they had things like specifications and project standards. Um, I once worked for a big consulting company where one project reportedly had a cake standard, which was the specification of the level of cake that you were required to bring on your birthday or other things. You know, and There were different levels. Anyway, you get the idea. But coding standards used to be a thing. Teams had written coding standards. We don't really do that now. Now, what are you going to put in your coding standard? If you're using C++, you have the C++ problem, which is which language are you even using? Which version? Um, you know, which features do you allow? This is particularly a C++ problem because it's a big language and the only sane way to survive, I guess. I mean, I've avoided this, but I think you probably need to just choose the subset you can cope with before you run away screaming. It's true of SQL as well. The, the traditional approach to... Um, um, solving it when we use SQL. Well, apart from the fact it's now completely gone out of fashion, but it's coming back. I promise you now, SQL's back. Um, the usual approach is to just ignore all of the recent innovations in SQL in the last 10 years and to pretend that they never happened. Like All of these versions since 1999 have new exciting features, but you probably prefer lazy initialization exceptions in your ORM to actually learning new versions of SQL and using that. Um, Again, you know, this is something you need to kind of figure out as a team. So JavaScript, it's a bit more of an issue because we notice that that kind of now changes every year, but this is, becomes a, a Java thing too. So the question is, you know, if you're joining the team and suddenly you're in charge, how do you establish the team coding style? What do you do? Um, slightly photoshopped for historical reasons, but this is a photo from my desk in about 2003, I think doing code review on A3 printer paper, print and code out on A3 and get a mug of coffee and a highlighter pen. Um, old school, because GitHub wasn't invented yet and our monitors were tiny. Um, but it turned out to be a very useful way of establishing style on a team. Code review is pretty much all you need. The only thing that's better than code review is pair programming. The only thing better than that is mob programming. So you might feel that all of this is an affront to your individuality. That's fine. There's a whole new wave of exciting typefaces that you can use for coding. You know, if you, if, if you search, if you Google for ideal coding font, you know, you'll waste a day choosing coding fonts, which is fine, because that's the only day you'll waste. Whatever font you're using, it's not in your commit, and your, co your colleagues don't see it. So if you want to be individual, do it on your own screen with a coding font, but have a team coding style. Implement a team coding style. So resolve all of the questions. Um, feel free to do it the quick way by just picking my opinions. Um, although they are opinions, to be fair. Um, and be very strict about preserving this style. Refactor to this style. Only use this style. And if you change the style, which you will have to, then you actually have to refactor to the new style and finish the refactoring. Because if you get halfway through, it's worse than not starting. Consistency counts. And evolve the thing. So, almost time to wrap up. Um, I guess I sort of have slightly too many slides. So I've said everything multiple times. It's hard, but it's worthwhile, and future you will thank you when you get it right. Um, it's the developer experience that maybe matters most, at least to you, but maintainability and productivity do matter to other people. Um, you can automate it. You can get better at naming. You need to make choices. You need to write code that's the good code, the best code you can write together. It's not an individual thing. That's all I have. If you were to want more, I can train your team on this. But for today, that was code style. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>